Hello guys, welcome to another video. I'm really excited because today we will talk about one of the most weighted features for 5.5. We are talking about async await. Let's explore today why this is so important and how we're gonna change the way we code in Swift forever. Let's start because yeah, we have a lot of magic to cover here. My name is Pete and this, this is Swift and Tips. Right, let's start asking us why the community requires to introduce a sync await. We have been for so long working without that, right? Working with closures or external dependencies, for example, Arc Swift, Promise Kit, or recently in iOS 13 combined. In fact, let me explore in detail here what we are doing to get the information provided in this Pokedex demo. By the way, if you want to know more about this pull to refresh action and for example this task or even more about a sync image, I strongly recommend you to watch my previous video about what's new in Swift UI 3.0 because it's the base of this demo. So we're going to focus today on the business logic to make this possible. Anyway, this is working. But right now, the magic is actually located in this loaded.load. This function is executing or call to the API. Let's see what's inside. And actually, it's just calling other function, which is combine load. As you might guess, this load action is using combine under the hood. This example could sound familiar because we talk in detail about it in our combine video. However, yeah, here we are using combine for a reason because Combine is giving us some flexibility to organize or process in what kind of actions we want to do. For example, you know, uh, getting the response, the coding, etc., etc. But today we won't talk so much about Combine. In fact, another question. Yeah, we are using Combine here, but why? That's because without other external dependency or first party dependency like Combine, our only option is just to use closures to execute this kind of behavior. So for that, let me transform this example using combine with only closure and see why we need to use other techniques or well, used to do that because now we will see the power of async await in just a moment. Okay, let's just ignore this for now and let's create the same load function but now using closures. Okay, the first thing we need to use here is this URL. I am using this one that is the same that combine load function is using. It's just here controlling the pagination to get different Pokemons over and over. Now, using closures, the next thing you need to use is, well, in this case, calling or API. To do that, we need to use URL session and create a task that we will execute that action. So let's create a task for that. And we will execute this method data task that it's requiring an URL. So the rest is just using the completion handler. This closure will provide the response once we execute that task to get the information from the network. And if you remember, this closure contains three parameters. One is data, which is the actual data that we received, the response from that URL that we tried to retrieve, and the error if we got anything wrong. All right, now what we need to do is validate the possible situations with these three parameters. The first one is just checking if we got an error. Mm, okay, let's try that. And if we got an error, the only thing we need to do is maybe, well, throw an error, right? Throw this error. Actually, no, we cannot do that. This is because this is a closure. We are inside of closure and this closure, it's not using throws keyword, which means this closure cannot throw an error. This is something really important. So in that way, we cannot propagate an error using throw. Our only way to do it is using another closure to propagate that. And that closure should come from this parameter. Okay, let's provide that closure. Let's mark this as escaping. Here we will use result object from Swift. We will say that our success case will be retrieving a list of Pokemon and we will return an error if something wrong happens. Okay, now here we can then use completion 
and return a failure and propagate the error. Okay, we got the error, but if we don't get any error, we need to check if actually we got um, a status code of 200. Let's see that. Okay, if this is happening, then something is wrong in the network, then we need to return another kind of error. But here, what I'm going to send is one of the errors that we have here. We have Pokemon error and we will use server error. Now, once we reach this else branch, we are ready for to finally get something from data. But data is optional. So yeah, we need to unwrap to see if we actually have something here. Otherwise, we need to return an error. And again, send another error. In this case, let's use no data. And don't forget to add this return because it's required in this guard statement. Okay, we got our data. Now it's time to decode our data. We will use JSON decoder this time. We want to decode this data and transform it into a Pokemon response object. Let's do that. And again, if we are not able to get anything, yeah, we are just returning no data. All right, after all this validation, finally, we can send our Pokemon list. Let's use our success case here in this completion. Okay, our success case here is then return that Pokemon list. So for that, we need to use Pokemon response dot result, which is the list of Pokemons. Yay, amazing. However, don't forget that you need to use task dot resume. Pretty common mistake. Okay, we are good here. However, uh, we need to do something with this completion. So yeah, let's go back to load method and then call this closure load there. Okay, let's call this closure and use here our completion handler. Let's use result and use a switch just to catch the different situations. For the error, just simply want to print the error and use self error, which is a Boolean method just to reflect that, yeah, we got an error. Now for success, we need to use the list. And here we will assign this list to our Pokemon data, which will be list reverse plus or previous data. We are using just for you to get the idea and see really easy the pull to refresh action. Also, don't forget to increase the offset for the pagination. However, we are getting access to self here inside this closure. So remember, we need to capture self to avoid any routine cycle. And of course, do the guard let dance. Okay, we are good to go, right? Let's run this. Oh, almost, because yeah, this thing is modifying the UI and remember that every action that is updating your UI needs to be in main thread. Okay, let's put this into a uh, main queue. Okay, okay, let's run this. Are we good now? Yeah, we're good. Okay, let's try the pull to refresh action. Looks like everything is working. Okay. But look how much code we had to use to just this simple pull to refresh and list uh, operations. Oh my God, it's a lot of boilerplate code. Also, it's pretty easy to make mistakes. For example, here, you need to make sure that you are sending the right completion because yeah, if we don't do anything, yeah, this thing is compiling. So there's no way for you to actually realize that you forgot something. Also, you are handling result, which is a kind of a boilerplate to, to say, okay, this is a failure error. This is a failure of other errors, so on, so on. And yeah, this is just a simple closure, but there are multiple situations in which one closure depends of other closure and other closure and so on. And then you have a nested closure instead of other, and that becomes even worse. What is the problem that a single way solve? Well, first of all, this one. Avoid to nesting things over and over inside of an if, inside of a closure, inside of another closure, so on, so on. That's one thing. And second thing, it's also try to make our code more readable because yeah, this thing is really, I mean, again, this is a really simple example. And can you imagine a really, really complicated example? Yeah, will be even worse to follow that. Oh, by the way, also, I need to remember that, yeah, you need also to use a completion handler here. And then you need to use, uh, you know, if you're 
accessing to self-reference, you need to capture it yourself and then you making sure that everything is in main thread, etc., etc. So yeah, it's a lot of things, a lot of preparation for your code to be ready. Okay, let's change the approach now and use a single way. Okay, now what we need to do here? Well, again, we need the URL and now we need to use URL session again. But this time, instead of using the closure, we will use an asynchronous function. Let's see that. Yeah, you have all these options here, but also you have these two methods here. But look the error here. It says that, yeah, this is a sync method and you cannot use an async method inside of a synchronous method. What it means is that, yeah, by default, this function is synchronous if you are not telling Swift anything. So in order to you to use any asynchronous function inside of this function, the only thing you need to use is the word async. Very simple. Now Swift will understand that this function is prepared to be asynchronous. Let's go back to data and yeah, we don't have that issue again. So we are ready to go to use whatever function we got here. In this case, let's use this one with URL. We have the URL, so let's do it. And for now, we don't care about any delay. Now, what is the return type of this? This is simply returning a tuple of data and URL response, like a normal function, like a synchronous function, right? It's Pretty simple. Let's capture the result of this function into two variables. Let's use this one for data and let's use this one for response. Now, in order to tell in Swift that this function is asynchronous and you have to wait for this one because you don't know when this asynchronous function will finish, you need to use await. This is more or less like, for example, when you are marking a function that is trouble that will produce an error on some time, you need to mark that function has throws, right? And then the caller needs to use try to reflect that, okay, I will try to do something, but I don't know if this will produce an error or not. It's the same way. So this function is marked as a sync, which means it's a synchronous function, but then the caller needs to use a way to say, okay, I will wait or I will mark this to, to be a wait and I will leave to the system to do the rest. By the way, this function is marking that we need to use try. So let's use try. And now the problem here is that if we have a throwable function, we need to mark this function to be throwable too. And for that, it's really simple. It's just using throws. A sync will be before throws or before the arrow that reflects the return type. In this case, it's not a return. There's no return type, but just for you, we can mark this as void just to get the complete syntax here. Okay, that's it. And you may guess, hey, where is the error value? There's no error value. I mean, yeah, it's implicit because since that this function is throwing an error, yeah, we will propagate that error automatically. So the color of this function will have to take care of that, not this function. Amazing. If everything is fine, we are getting data automatically. So if we got any error, this function will throw an error and that's it. So everything after this line 84 will be ready to go. So this is amazing. Also, if you want to validate something about the URL response, we can do that. So let's do it. As you can see here, we are checking if this response contains a status 200 and if it's the case, we will continue. Otherwise, we are throwing an error right away to say that we got a server error for any reason. Amazing. Now let's decode our data really quick. Finally here, we are ready to go. The only thing we need to use is, you know, maybe handling the scenarios that our completion handler did before. And that's it. Let's go back for a moment what we did here. First, we got the URL and then we use an asynchronous function. In this case, we are using URL session that contains a data function that is asynchronous and 
it's capable to read the URL, the information from that URL, and then return information. In this case, we got data and response if everything's okay. Otherwise, this try action will then produce an error and then we won't continue with the rest of code. And anything that is calling this async load will then propagate an error. But what is happening here and it's interesting, it is await. Await is telling Swift that this function will be suspended for a short period of time. What suspension is doing here is just giving the control to the system about the process of this operation. So in other words, at this point, we are telling the system, okay, take care of this function. And once we got something, go back to the point. That means we will wait until receiving an anything. And if everything is fine, we will continue with execution of this line and so on. Also, the good thing is that we are freeing the thread to do other things. We are not locking threads here, which is amazing. And also the color of this function needs to mark this as a wait because this function is asynchronous. And in this way, you generate a tree of asynchronous operation. The system is free to do other action while it's getting the response of what is happening here. Now let's call this async load in or load method. We need to just call async load. But again, we need to mark this method load to be asynchronous to. And mark this as try because yeah, we are propagating an error. We need to use a wait to mark this as a synchronous function that is waitable. Okay, now we need to handle the error. So let's do a do catch action. Let's run this. Oh, we got something. Yeah, we need to inform Swift here that, yeah, this function requires a wait. And it's working. As you can see, we are getting the Pokemons here and our pull to refresh action, it's working. It's amazing. Now, a couple of things here. If you are marking a function to be a sync, this is not automatically be suspendable by the system. It's the system which will decide if this function requires to be suspended or not. You are just marking that, yeah, this function is prepared to be asynchronous and it's prepared to be suspendable, but it's not mandatory to do that by the system. At the same time, if you are marking this to be a wait, there's no guarantee that this function requires to be suspendable. It's just important for you to understand that. Look at that. This code is like a synchronous code, right? It's like a normal code that you use. There's no any closure here that we need to care or something. You just need to handle this situation and if everything is fine, then you continue here. Otherwise, you got an error. And here, with this just simple word, you are telling Swift that, yeah, this function is prepared to be suspended at some point. And the system will take care of that. There's no requirement to you to use external dependencies or anything else. Compare that with this. It's so annoying how much thing we had to use in the past without any external dependency handling this situation. Ugh, my eyes. My OCD is ah so happy. Pretty short lines to get the same result. Also, you don't have to use this thing at all. Now, before ending, I would like just to point out something because I saw some messages on Twitter saying that, yeah, it's the end of Combine, blah, blah, blah. I would like to say, no, I mean, Combine, yeah, you can get the same result that we are using with a sync or with closures using combine. And yeah, there is a functional way that we are using here. But combine, it's also for you to create streams of data from a publisher to a subscriber. And actually, you can create asynchronous calls with combine. Yeah, you can create your own extensions to make, for example, an async map or something. I will leave you in the description one great article from John Sondo that uh, talk more about that. So, but in other words, yeah, you can use combine and asynchronous functions together. They are not fighting each other. You have now more tools for your development since iOS 15, of course. So tell me, what do you think? Do you think this is so revolutionary for Swift? I would like to know your thoughts about that in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and tell me 
which video would like to see next? I am really happy to read your comments and explore more with you in details other things. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter because it's the fastest way to communicate and see what video or other things are coming for Swift and Tips. Thank you so much and have a great day.